Hello folks, welcome to week 21 of my study vlog. This week I studied Ireland and in particular I studied the uh, Remembering and Forgetting Ireland which focused on the kind of revolution that happened in Ireland in terms of separating away from England and that occurred around about the, uh, the time of the, well began it's a grey area, but a big event happened during the First World War. But before we get on to that, let's do a positive note. With the coronavirus going on at the moment, there is a lot less people pretty much everywhere <laughs> apart from homes. And uh, that has meant that zoos and theme parks have been quite quiet, apart from the animals that have uh, been there. And for two pandas in Hong Kong, uh, the privacy has uh, been a bit of a revelation for them. They've been able to uh, breed successfully. And uh, this is a story that's come from um, Ocean Park in Hong Kong. The two pandas, Ying Ying and Li Li, have been there since 2007, but they've been unable to successfully uh, pair up and have a child until now. So it just goes to show that a little privacy um, goes a long way with with couples. Um, and I think it's just a, a quite a heartwarming story that out of everything, there's something positive that's still out there now and again. So look out for those positive stories and uh, reflect on them and enjoy them. That's my positive note for this week. Week 21, which was about forgetting and remembering Ireland and about the identity of Ireland and how it's been remembered, in particular how the Irish people have responded to things that have occurred in their country. So we're going back to 1916, which was during the crest of the First World War. And Ireland played a big part in that because it was one of the barriers, if you like, of the rest of the world to England. It was in the way. And what you saw was the English um, in particular try to form a bit of a hub there to uh, stop the, to, to ensure that they were controlling the war from that part of the world. However, uh, a group of, um, and I say group loosely because it was 1,600 uh, Irish volunteers or the Irish Citizens Army, um, a mixture of the two, because they were two separate factions but came together, they all clubbed together on one particular day that was known as the Easter Rising, uh, which was the uh, 24th of April. And of course, at this point in my video, <laughs> technology lets me down because I shouldn't be using this particular computer as it only has a minute and then it's decided to go on to um, screensaver, which is fun and it's not opening. So I'll keep talking while I'm waiting for that to do its thing. Joys of working with technology. I'm going to keep this in because I've tried to do this several times now. It's going to make a noise and it is getting boring. But the topic isn't. So Easter Rising, 24th of April. And we're looking at Sackville Street in particular in Dublin, which, which was the subject of uh, the uh, Irish volunteers, Irish citizen army, looking to make their make their 
Thank you. <laughs> Make their HQ, which was the general post office on Sackville Street. And so they swarmed in and took this place, particularly because it was the area where the British Army wanted to send out their communications and ensure that they were in control of trade and also in control of uh, operations and directions that were going out during the war. So they took over this place, the, uh, the generals, the commanders of this band of volunteers. And it's important to note that these people weren't soldiers uh, as such. They were general people, but they were also intelligent people. You had uh, professors and school teachers and poets and activists all as a part of this. And two people in particular that were important are James Connolly and uh, Patrick or Patrick uh, Pierce, who uh, were the commanders of this um, vigilante operation. And they stormed the post office and they took it over so that essentially the British Army couldn't get that information out to the uh, to where they wanted to. And they uh, went out, they lifted the uh, Irish Republic flag, which wasn't really a thing at that point in time, apart from uh, for them, it wasn't necessarily a flag that was recognised at that time, but it was their flag that they rose up instead of the Union Jack um, or the United Kingdom flag on the building. They uh, brought the Irish Republic flag up onto the building and then they went out onto the stone steps and it was, now that I've got my thing open, um, Connolly, James Connolly, who read a proclamation. And the proclamation went like this. Irish men and Irish women, in the name of God and the dead generations from which she receives her old tradition of nationhood, Ireland, through us, summons her children to her flag and to strikes for her freedom. Now, he didn't read that in English. He read that in the Irish language, uh, Irish Gaelic. And he did that because this was the point of their rising. They wanted, they wanted for Ireland, for the Irish people, a ownership of their own destinies and the events that were occurring around them. And they hadn't just wanted this during the war, they had wanted this a long time before. And that's why this chapter becomes important about the culture and the identity of Ireland. Because Ireland before then, and after then as well, for some time, was under British occup occupancy, uh, ownership. Um, the Irish recognised their own culture and things that you'd think of normally um, when you think of Ireland, such as dance and art and architecture, um, music, writing, the language. But at that point, England had already owned Ireland for some significant time. And so they still, they were pretty much driving that out to the point where uh, education, politics, was completely under uh, British rule, was completely under the, the English um, censorship almost of, of the Irish culture. Um, so people who were politicians, were activists, were school teachers, had a huge concentration on wanting Ireland to belong to the Irish. Um, for those who have uh, been alive for more than, um, well, the, the 2000s, then you may well remember that Ireland has had quite a, a bloody and uh, defeating past it, and some terrible things have occurred there. But out of that, other things have, have developed. So the, during 1916, on this day, on the rising, they stood on the steps, 
to no crowd. Nobody really knew that this was going on apart from the volunteers and citizens of the, uh, the Irish volunteers and citizens army. Nobody else kind of heard this person speaking in Irish and been thinking, oh, what's going on over there? But the army knew what was going on. And soon after this quite bloody and quite quick uh, defeat of the rising occurred and a lot of the volunteers who weren't killed um, were captured and those that survived, a lot of them were executed, including Connolly and Pierce. So you found that this rising at first looked like a complete bust. It looked like the Irish had lost, the English had won, and that was that. Um, but that didn't stop people. That, didn't, that in fact was more like a catalyst for the next, uh, not uprising, but the next fight that occurred in terms of Ireland and England. And so after the war, there was the war for independence in which the, uh, the, the true kind of battle began after World War II, after World War I even, um, had occurred. Then the Irish started to try to push for their country to belong to them. And you also had people who by that point had been soldiers and had come back from the war expecting to, or at least hoping that they would be welcomed and instead they, they got shunned and uh, ignored because of what had happened on um, Easter, on that um, day in Easter in 1916. So they started to campaign for their own rights um, and in fact there's a garden that's in Dublin and that took over, it, it, well, it was started in uh, 19, um, 1919, this garden, in terms of being a garden of remembrance for those that lost their lives during the war. It was only finished in 1988, and that was after it being halted and started and halted and started, finally settled on some land and then they started to build it and then in the 60s all building stopped because there wasn't any funding towards it and eventually it was rediscovered and repushed in 1980 and it still took eight years for that garden to be completed to be fully built and to be open to the public and since then there have been a lot of changes you've had the the queen visit and uh, pay your respects there and that was quite a, a big thing. Um, so you had treaties that were signed in 1921 and 1922 and this was the Anglo-Irish Treaty but it still didn't benefit the Irish, it was still a almost mocking agreement of, of Ireland being a free state um, because English still wanted their claws in that. Um, in uh, 1948 you had the Republic of Ireland Act, then in 1966 you had the Golden Jubilee of uh, the 1916 Rising and that again seemed to, to spark up a few feelings and uh, desires that things should be changed. Um, and in particular, you saw um, statues start to be either demolished or, or even completely taken out of the picture. And again, this is where Ireland wanted to forget its past. It wanted to remove um, certain aspects. So in 1948, there was the statue of Queen Victoria that was um, built outside of Lannister House. But it was removed in 1948 because Queen Victoria was on the throne during the potato fam famine that occurred in Ireland and there was no evidence of, of their um, 
there being any royal or even English desire to um, rectify that situation. And then in 1966, Nelson's column, again, a uh, prominent English figure, which stood in Ireland. And again, if you've uh, lived uh, before 1966, then you might know of it. But in, after 1966, um, you probably weren't aware that that was there because it was completely demolished by a renegade act. Um, and so now I believe a, a, I've been to Dublin a few times and I've seen a spire that's there. I believe that's what, uh, where that stands now and it's more of a symbol um, of positivity for Ireland than the negative symbol of British rule that used to be there. So a lot has changed since Ireland and it's only really um, as early as 1988, uh, 1998 even, when the uh, peace agreement for Ireland was signed on Good Friday and that has changed things significantly. There's still a lot of ill feelings, there's still a lot of pain for Ireland but there's also hope and positivity. But throughout this there was a lot of information that was misremembered, a lot of culture that was misremembered. Um, and you find this, it's a thing called collective memory and it's where traditions are remembered by word of mouth rather than by actual witnesses and uh, collective um, evidence of things being such. Things like, um, for example, if you've, if you've ever been told a story that came down through Chinese whispers then you're being told somebody else's impersonation of that memory and not their own physical memory of what happened. And so you found this with a lot of folklore where stories of kings and um, heroes in Irish folklore suddenly becoming figureheads for particular aspects of, um, of what became political uprising. Um, in one particular aspect, there's a politician called uh, Douglas Hyde who reflects on a um, particular Irish hero in his use of explaining that Ireland didn't used to uh, submit to anyone, let alone Ireland, and used to fight for their own rights. <laughs> and since then we've seen that as well in terms of how cliche some Irish aspects are, how um, English see them as this, that and the other, and leprechauns and this, that and the other, and the Irish see themselves as strong and, and powerful, and even to the terms of their women being strong and powerful, which is not in dispute in this video. I um, don't feel as one way or the other. I think it's it's brilliant that uh, anybody, especially at this time of age, um, have belief in themselves and in their identity and their, their culture. So it comes onto question whether uh, we should look at anything that's happened in Ireland as negative or positive. Yes, horrible things have happened and positive things have happened, but they've all been to a leading aspect of uh, what happened in the future. Um, so a f another point to mention before I wrap up this video is that as Ireland's uh, identity and growth as a nation um, and under more free Irish rules, uh, you also saw a bit of a push of the English being pushed out of the country. So you found that when um, there were the, what were called big houses in Ireland, which were like big mansions that were owned by the English, when things started to change in Ireland, then that land was granted back to the Irish farmers to use to, to grow and to plant crops and, and things. 
So a lot of that land was sold off by the owners of the land um, and sold primarily back to farmers rather than to um, anybody English or who had a feeling or stake in that particular land and those particular buildings. So they were demolished, they were destroyed, and now only a handful of them remain, um, which in one sense is positive that Ireland got its land back, and in another sense is a sense of removing that, that identity out of Ireland and focusing on the positive. There's a few buildings there that are now heritage buildings that are protected, um, but a lot of them were destroyed and removed, even when the land wasn't reused by Irish farmers. The, just couldn't afford to, to keep that land anymore. Um, so that's that chapter pretty much. It was all about the focus of how Ireland was um, remembering one thing and remembering the past and the, the actions that happened and how people who were seen as vigilantes and, and negative, such as Pierce and Connolly, later became almost folklore and uh, also became heroes in a sense of the islands that we know of and uh, visit and see and is remembered today but it also forgets a lot of the other aspects of the past in the same token. So my question to you for this week is if you could go back and look at something differently in your life, what would that be? Would there be a certain time where you'd like to re-remember something? I can remember one particular point where I had quite a, a horrible uh, argument with a family member and called them a few things that I uh, regret to this day. But even though it's been forgotten, I still remember it. And so I'd love to be able to remember that indifferently and wish that it was something, something differently had happened there, even though it hasn't massively had an impact apart from made me realise that I need to consider my actions more carefully. So that's today's video. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, then please subscribe and like and enjoy and such. It's gone on to screensaver again, but it doesn't matter this time because I'm done. All good things. Stay safe out there. Scaramouche.